MWC is done for another year and as usual it brought us loads of new tech to sink our teeth into. Of course the biggest phone on people's lips was the Samsung Galaxy S5. Some were impressed, some were disappointed and we were left hmm, kind of feeling a bit of both. In any case in today's show we'll be bringing you everything you need to know about Samsung's new flagship phone including all the new features outlined and explained, when you can expect to get your hands on it, how much it will cost you, and then to finish things off, we'll be looking at what Apple needs to bring to the iPhone 6 to take on Samsung's formidable new flagship. So we saw the Samsung Galaxy S5 break cover at MWC in Barcelona. You saw it and got hands on with it. What did you make of it? See, now the thing is, when I first picked it up and I first saw it and everything, I thought, you know, what? I'm disappointed. You know, it does look so much like a Galaxy S4 with a little bit of Note 3 thrown in there again. And it, it was weird. It was after about sort of like, you know, the next day when I sort of, I'd played with it for about half an hour and, it, you know, did all the stuff that you expect it to do. And the next day you suddenly thought, you know what, what could, what could Samsung have done really apart from really redesign the whole thing, which I think is the only thing that really fails on the Galaxy S5. Design wise, it's not that exciting. But beyond that, Samsung's got rid of all the gimmicks. It's got rid of, you know, the kind of the innovation of air swiping and all this stuff and just said, right, this is, these are the things people care about. They want a good camera. They want it to actually say, you know, robust and protected. And you know, want battery life to last, and just have sort of the, the ease of use that people really want. So I don't really see what Samsung could have done more in terms of wowing us. But I about think it an all metal wowed. body. Yeah, exactly. So design-wise, it definitely did you know miss the bar on that. But I mean, what do you think about the internals? Do they do they do it for you? Well, it's definitely a step up from the S4, and I think Samsung has hit the right heights with the specs in the S5. It's got a 5.1 inch full HD display, Super AMOLED, so it really pops, it looks lovely. Do you not think that it should have been a 2K display? Because I was unsure, you know, I thought battery life could have been hurt, but it would have been a real step forward headline-wise. Everyone's talking about 2K, but I'm still not personally convinced that that's the way to go. Full HD is is more than good enough for what I use my phone for. It's great for watching movies on, it's great for playing games. I don't think 2K will add that much extra wow factor, although it's difficult to say having never seen one in the flesh, but I'm not too concerned about that. I mean, other advances in the S5 include the Snapdragon 801 processor. Uh, around the back, they've also given the camera a little boost. It's now 16 megapixels. It's still, you know, in the megapixel race. It's nothing on the Lumia 1020 at 41 or even the Xperia Z2 at 20.7, but it, it's still good enough for a smartphone camera. Uh, and also another big bonus of Samsung devices is the inclusion of a micro SD slot allowing you to build on the 16 or 32 gigabytes of storage inside. So with the Galaxy S5 we did see some new advancements from Samsung, the first of which is the fingerprint scanner. Tell us more about that. So now I was, I was a bit confused by this because the first time I saw it I thought well no, that's going to be rubbish, it's going to be as good as the HTC One Max simply because it, it's not the same as Apple's which was you press it once to wake the screen up and while you're doing that that's, that's you getting into the phone. And I thought, you know, it's that one click, very easy step to go forward, and you're in. I think that's exactly how it should be, and that's why Apple, I think, nailed it first go. With Samsung, you have to wake the phone up and then slide, the, slide your thumb or finger down. And, you know, Samsung actually wants you to ideally do it in a straight line, which is quite difficult. Now, when I was testing it, it turns out it was quite easy to do it, you know, sideways on, so it's quite a natural fit. And while it's annoying to have that sort of two-step process to wake up your phone, it does add a lot of security, and it isn't too bad. And on top of that, Samsung has sort of implemented it so much better throughout the phone, so you can protect certain elements of the phone, sort of certain files, you can have it so that only it only applies to certain elements of it, and also this deal with PayPal is, is great, I mean, I, I want to see how far it reaches through the internet, but being able to scan your fingerprint and pay for stuff, you know, the amount of times you have to enter your password in, move to another site, and I think that's a real innovation, it's exactly what people need to be doing for biometrics, it should be your fingerprint's there and I want to use it as much as I can through the phone. Now the only question is how much of that is secure. Of course the whole thing is going to be absolutely safe because Samsung wouldn't have put it on otherwise. But we want, you know, users want to know exactly how secure it is. You know, Apple says all your fingerprint data is stored, no one can access it, and that's why it's used on a very limited basis. You know, Samsung's using it a lot more, so we just want to make sure exactly how safe that is. Now obviously, you know, using your finger to, to get into the phone is, is one thing, but you can also use it to check on your heart rate all the time. I mean, it seems like a really weird thing to do. It does, yeah. I was quite surprised by that. I mean, it makes sense in the Galaxy Gear Fit smart band because that's on your wrist, it's there while you're exercising and it can monitor your heart rate. Whereas on your phone, you physically got to take the phone out of your pocket, you've got to then locate the right area on the back of the phone, touch your finger against it, etc. It doesn't really give you real-time stats. You, you know, if you're on a run, you can't 
quickly just get your phone out and, and check your heart rate, you've got to sort of come to a stop and then you don't get an accurate reading. So I was surprised by that whole inclusion. Yeah, it's, 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 it's quite active in terms of you know, finding your own heart rate because I think that you have to think at a certain, because you have to do it every t same time every day really to get an accurate idea. So you have to find a time do your heart rate and just see over the, over the days and months and weeks how far it's coming down and sort of get an accurate opinion of your fitness. And I think really it should just be when your phone is in your hand, you know, that's, that would be the ideal way if it, if it could read just while your phone is sitting there in the palm mm. and working out exactly your heart rate just throughout the day. That would give you a much more accurate reading. It seems a bit like a gimmick. You know, it's a lot of hardware and it's quite expensive to put on there for something that doesn't really add much more than the headline feature. So it's probably the most gimmicky feature <coughs> Samsung's thrown on there really. But on the flip side of that, you've got the camera, which I think is, you know, a bar the fact that it's got a lot of, you know, bells and whistles around it, it's probably the best thing about it. I mean, what do you think? I was, I was slightly surprised that they didn't go for 20 megapixels plus, maybe. We don't need 20 megapixels, well, though. We don't, but if, if someone wants a smartphone with a good camera and they go into a shop and they see the Lumia 1020 or the Xperia Z2, they're going to be drawn to those because on the simple megapixel factor, of course, you know, it's not all megapixel count. It's... Uh, OIS, optical imaging stabilization, and all the other background software tweaks and the the aperture and and all that around the camera. So that it is a decent bundle, and it's still going to take very good shots. It's going to take really good shots because I think you know when I was testing it, one of the things that was impressive was that autofocus promise did come true. You take a picture and instantly it was in it was in focus. And I think you know for me the most important thing is not having blurry photos. And the great thing I suppose from Samsung's perspective of this is they've got so much marketing budget they can sell that message over and over again, like blur-free photos, blur-free photos, and people would be like, that is brilliant, that's exactly what I want, because yeah, megapixels are important to some people, and they're comparing side by side, but I think exactly that's what it needs to be doing. The thing that doesn't work is that sort of selective background focus thing. You know, it was, it's a great idea that you can, you know, change the focus of your shots afterwards, mm. but you have to, first of all, you know, it's not automatically enabled, and you can't do that by the looks of things, so you have to go in there, press the button, take the shot, it processes for about, well, it ta takes about two or three seconds to take the shot, then processes for about another eight seconds, and then you can just slightly change the focus of it. It's not intuitive, it, it's not quick. I mean, Sony and LG have both done a lot better implementation of that, and I think it's a shame because Samsung will probably be selling that quite heavily as, as a big feature of the S5, and I think this is a phone that should be completely selling itself on its real strengths. One of the other strengths is the fact it is waterproof. Yes, uh, I. That is something that I really liked. I, I loved this S4 Active last year, actually, because it had that sort of lightly rugged and waterproof, dustproof feel. It was pretty chunky, well, though. It was pretty chunky. And so seeing Samsung combine basically the two into a, an, a normal yeah. smartphone size it is great. And it puts it back against the likes of Sony, who have been waterproofing their high-end flagships for, for quite a while now. Um, so it's good to see the same come in from Samsung. I think, uh, you know, apart from that cover on the bottom, Samsung seems to be a little bit more like a normal phone. It seems to be, the, you know, people are crit criticizing the design being too similar to the S4. But the fact is it's the same thing and now it's waterproof. That's a, that's a pretty big step forward. It's far less forced. Yeah. Um, whereas all the flaps you get on a Sony phone, they do seem a little bit cumbersome at times. And the other big thing is battery saver mode. Now, when I first saw this, I dismissed it again because I thought it would sound a lot like Sony's stamina mode, you know, the fact that it would just slow things down and, and take it down to its base level and just hope for the best in eking things out. Now, in practice, it's actually a lot more annoying than that. <laughs> you, it, it makes the screen black and white, uh, which, you know, it makes sense in terms of battery saving. But then on top of that, it allows you to have, I think, six or eight apps, you know, from a, from a fairly short list of things you can do. So, it's, you know, it does include things like the internet, um, obviously calling and messaging and things like that. But it's a very limited way that you can use your phone. Almost to the point of thinking, if you're that bothered, just turn it off. I mean, it's, it's a cool feature to have, but I'd, I'd like it to have had an element of that Sony. So you could say, look, I'm not, I don't want to completely go in sort of black mode here. I just want it to completely be something that can just have, you know, uh, a, le a level of functionality that I want, but not completely dead. So in terms of rivals, the Sony Xperia Z2, the much rumoured new HTC One and the even more rumoured iPhone 6. How is the S5 stacking up against those? Now, see, I think HTC's got an open goal here. I mean, the fact is that, uh, you know, th last year, critically, the HTC One was the best phone out there. Um, and I think Samsung has played it safe here. It's, it's, it's hit the marks, which I think is a great thing for a phone that's going to sell loads because you want people to sort of be positive about the device. But HTC can now go in there again with its, you know, with, with greater innovation, hopefully, with that sort of, we've seen a, a two cameras on the back. Um, and making hardware move forward rather than just doing it all on software. The metal, de metal body looks like it's going to be improved and look a lot more sleek and lovely. And yeah, I really think the HTC One 2 or the all-new HTC One, or whatever it will be called, will be a real winner. And I hopefully you know, we'll see more people at sort of the top end of the smartphone game. 
I think the Xperia Z2 is a real competitor as well. I mean, Sony doesn't quite have the marketing clout, and you know, it's not pushing the same message as Samsung is. But I think if you were to choose between the two phones, there's very little between them. The Sony is even more of a stable device. You know, it's it's got quite a a premium build. It's it's, it's fairly blocky to some people, but it, it does hit the marks in that respect. When it comes to the iPhone 6, I think Apple really needs to step its game up now. The S5, uh, Z2, the, you know, the all-new HTC One will really say this is what consumers want. So it needs the iPhone 6 to be a beautiful design. It needs to have a bigger screen. It needs to have functionality on top of just saying, you know what, everything's improved slightly. Everything's a little bit better because. For all intents and purposes, it looks the same as the five, and, and people care about design and the way it looks and having, you know, the latest thing on the market. And I think that Apple really needs to step forward because people ask the question, "What's the new iPhone going to be like?" I don't want to just say a bit like the old one, but better. It needs to be a real step forward because Apple needs to reinvent itself. Well, a lot of the rumours are saying that Apple may well be going that way. There's lots of talk about a larger screen phone again and something with a slightly different design. Who knows what iOS 8 will have in store for us. We expect that to sort of be announced in June at WWDC ahead of an iPhone launch. So it does look like that Apple may be going down that road and it'll be really interesting to see if it can sort of put itself back on the map. So the key question you're probably asking is when can I get my hands on the Galaxy S5? Well, there's good news there because it's coming on April the 11th in 150 countries around the world. The slightly worse news is the fact it'll be a little bit more expensive than the Galaxy S4. We're thinking around £550 SIM free and that translates to about $650 in the US. That's all from us this week, but we leave you now with five things the internet got wrong about the Galaxy S5. We were secretly all hoping that 2014 would be the year Samsung finally waved bye-bye to plastic and embraced metal, but sadly this wasn't the case. Instead, the Galaxy S5 gives us something that's sort of halfway between the Note 3 and the Galaxy S4, which, while an improvement, isn't quite as shiny as we were hoping for. Retina scanning on the Galaxy S5 kept popping up in internet rumours, but ultimately turned out to be a no-show. We can't say we're overly disappointed, especially when fingerprint scanning is a lot more practical in day-to-day -day use. We heard a couple of whispers that the Galaxy S5 might be revealed as the flagship device for Samsung's Tizen OS. We did see a Tizen toting Samsung device appear at MWC, but it was the company's second generation gear smartwatch rather than the showstopper handset. Bendy displays are all the rage these days and LG and Samsung are currently both flexing their stuff in the smartphone arena with the G Flex and the Galaxy Round respectively. The S5 was also tipped to come with a curved screen at one point, but ended up being a regular straight-edged affair instead. Many thought Samsung would be hot on the heels of the iPhone 5S's 64-bit chip and would release the S5 with a similarly powerful CPU. The Galaxy S5 actually comes with a more run-of-the-mill quad-core processor, but Samsung did make clear it's working on 64-bit smartphones that could be heading our way in 2014, most likely with the Note 4.